right. Hopefully it's in the right order. Okay. Out. We're going to have some announcements. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you, but <laughs> I, uh, good morning. I just want to remind each of you, if you are not already aware, that every Sunday after worship, the fourth and fifth grade is utilizing the coffee bar area and tables. We have a beautiful, beautiful problem that our current fourth and fifth graders uh, class has outgrown um, the previous room that we had for them. So we just want to, yeah, <laughs> it's a, a, a wonderful problem. So I just want to remind you, for those of you who may be utilizing those tables or utilizing that space after worship, just to be mindful of, of the class. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, I almost missed my spot. I was still out there. So um, just wanted to make a little announcement on the events that's coming up. Um, one is actually not on here, which I just want to mention it. it. It is the one Vince was speaking about last week. The September 30th is the all, all Mac body fellowship with Bob Petty um, where we're going to have lunch. And I'm sorry, what? It was it? Oh, it is at the top. There we go. I should read it. There we go. It is at the top. Well, thank you. So there we go. Um, at the top, September 30th. Let me highlight that one. for that. That's uh, the big one coming up, September 30th. And then there's a new one for October 7th, which is just a week after that. Um, it's called Home Group Fellowship. Um, and so what we want to do is the people, the home group leaders felt like we want to have an event, a social, where we can make it really easy and accessible to meet people and the leaders and the folks who are in home groups um, to just get to know them and somehow fellowship a little bit. And, and, and if those who are interested in joining um, will be, you know, easy way to, to meet people. But it, it, that, this, the home group fellowship event, please be known, that, make sure that you are all welcome uh, to that, even if you're not in a home group, even if you're not interested, that's going to be a big fellowship thing that's 
open for the whole body um, and then we'll, we'll see make some connections and have some sparks going and see what comes out of that so that's October 7th um, for that one thank you Hi, my name is Barb Weeza, and I am going to start the women's Bible study. Um, and the book is called Lord, Is It Warfare? Teach Me to Stand, written by Kay Arthur. This study um, is about 11 weeks. Um, was trying to see if uh, Wednesday or Thursday was better for people. Um, so if you have questions for me, I am going to be in the back today. I'd like to start about 6.30 and um, so that, you know, if we need um, child care, that's why we're going to do it on Wednesday as well as Thursday night. Um, look to either Amazon or eBay if you'd like to get a book. And I'm also told, and it is a great resource, if you have a Kindle and, or an iPad, you can um, download it as an ebook as well. And um, so I'd like to see you there, have you join me, and thanks. Let's worship. Yes, let's. You can stand back up. I like to keep, like to keep you guys guessing a little bit. So we are going to start singing now. But I want to read first from Psalm 33 um, <clears throat> in the message version. It says, Earth creatures, bow down before God. World dwellers, down on your knees. Here's why. He spoke, and there it was. In place the moment he said so. God takes the wind out of Babel pretense. He shoots down the world's power schemes. God's plan for the world stands up. All his designs are made to last. Blessed is the country with God for God. Blessed are people he's put in his will. From high in the skies, God looks around. He sees all Adam's brood. From where he sits, he overlooks all us earth dwellers. He has shaped each person in turn. Now he watches everything we do. No king succeeds with a big army alone. No warrior wins by brute strength. Horsepower is not the answer. No one gets by on muscle alone. Watch this. God's eye is on those who respect him, the ones who are looking for his love. He's ready to come to their rescue in bad times. In lean times, he keeps body and soul together. We're depending on God. He's everything we need. What's more, our hearts brim with joy since we've taken for our own his holy name. Love us, God, with all you've got. That's what we're depending on. God, we come this morning expecting to meet you, expecting to experience your love and wanting to pour out our love, our praise to you. Would you lead us? spoken words a conscious of reminder of forgiveness that I need who is this king of glory who offers it to me who is this king of angels the Prince of Peace, revealing things of heaven and all its mysteries. The Spirit's ever longing for His grace and wish to stand. Who is this King of Glory? Son of God and Son of Man. His name is Jesus, precious Jesus. 
This next song we're gonna sing is a, a new one, and it's um, it's really just all about the hope that we have in God. And I was thinking about how that's that's a lot of what sets us apart as Christians. We are the people who have hope. So um, just take this song in. This this is all just tons of truth about the hope we have in God.
Oceans rise and mountains fall. He never fails. So take heart. His love lead us through the night. Hold on to hope.
Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the furnace's drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, hearing the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless faith, the gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bringing forth a glorious day up from the ground he rose again and as he stands in victory since first has lost Precious blood of Christ. No guilt and Christ is clear. My 
sins have been paid in full. There's no condemnation here. I live in the good of this. My Father. I'm leaving my fears behind me now. The old is gone, the new has come. What you complete is completely done. Where is with Christ the victory won? What do you I don't know what lies ahead What if I fail again well, You are my confidence And you'll keep me to the end Cause I'm leaving my fear
ourselves, open ourselves to you. Say, Lord, draw us close. Let your words be life to us. Help us to let go of everything else that claims to bring life but is counterfeit. Lord, you are worthy. We praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Are we okay now? All right. 
Well, I get to talk about one of the, perhaps the most uh, important incident in the history of the world is where the very Son of God came on earth to talk about how much he loves us and how God feels about us and demonstrated in word and deed how one can conduct yourself in this world that's so full of sin and darkness and despair and lies and untruth. So how much did he love us? Uh, I liked it when one young man in our church years ago said he had a message for the congregation and he said, uh, do you know how much Jesus loves us? And he just stood there and stood there. And pretty soon you could hear weeping throughout the congregation. It was one of the shortest and most effective messages I heard. He, he didn't become a preacher, but he became a great father and a great husband. He understood the love of God. Now, I don't know how you interpret the love of God, but for me, looking at the love of God through this message today is one of the most powerful, powerful indications of how deeply God loves each of us. And we all come with different needs today. Some have personal problems. Some have problems that you've been fighting in your spirit life for years. Uh, some have financial problems. We, we all have difficulties. We all have difficulties. And, and to the degree that we can understand the message of Jesus is, is how free we can be in carrying those burdens from day to day. And how successful we will be in dealing with those burdens uh, from day to day. So it's a privilege to talk about our Lord and Savior who came to a point of decision and, uh, and, and ac accepted the word of his Father and went to the cross on your behalf and on my behalf. And even though it may not feel like it, it did take care of every problem you have had, you will have, or ever will have. It did. But it all depends on how we connect with that sacrifice. So I want to pray for all of us today uh, before I begin to share from the Scripture. And just pray that uh, somehow God can reveal something to you today that perhaps you've been hungering for, wanting, needing, uh, something that has been uh, maybe an unspoken request even in your own life that you've not been satisfied with life as you found it. Uh, maybe you've not been satisfied with your job, your marriage, or whatever. Something in you is, is not completely settled. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit can come today with a settling spirit and help us to more fully understand the truth that's in this. We, we are in desperate need of truth, folks. Desperate need. It's getting hard to know when truth is being spoken anymore unless you have discernment. If you have discernment, you may discern that truth is being spoken. But I, I think without discernment, you'll not know when you're being spoken to in a truthful way or whether the person speaking is lying to you. It's, it's difficult to tell. And, and it's such a poor example for the next generation. I feel sorry for the next generation if we don't model something of the Spirit of Christ in our life and in our church. So let's pray. Well, Father, we stand here today uh, to talk about one of the most important stories that's in this whole book. And the one that perhaps has influenced us the most is how much you love us that you allowed your own son, your only son, to go to the cross to take on himself all of the sin and the filth and the degrading things that can happen to a human being. It, it was his desire that he take it all to the cross and pay the penalty that was required for our sin. And once for all, it was cared for. It's hard for me to understand that sometimes because sometimes I feel unworthy, sometimes I feel guilty, sometimes I feel despondent because I haven't achieved much in my life or I haven't achieved anything great in my life. 
or I don't seem to have much recognition among my fellow men that I am important and I care. So Lord, I know that you care for us beyond all other things. You care for us. You're, we're the chief part of your creation. You created us. You promised you'd never leave us nor forsake us, that you'd always go before us. The thing I like about tomorrow the best, Father, is that you're going to be there because you said you would be. So I love that about tomorrow. I don't know what I'll be doing. I don't know what will happen, but I know you'll be there. And that makes it a welcome sign for me that you'll be there. So thank you for all of our tomorrows. And if we have not yet found that connection with you, that really allows you to transfer truth into our spirits and minds, may it be so today, may it be so, that you, we find that way to release our own spirit, that your Holy Spirit can come in and fulfill us in every sense of that word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, next Sunday, Brother Ray gets to talk about the resurrection, and that's fun. And then the next Sunday, uh, Brother Bob Petty is going to be speaking, starting us out in the book of Acts. We're going to move on into Acts the Sunday after. So, and that's exciting to see how the church was formed and, and what those people did to learn to gather together and learn to work together and how the Holy Spirit led them to form what we call the early church. So that's a blessing. But today I'm going to begin in uh, chapter 23, verse 18. And this is the point where Jesus is before Pilate. And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man, release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. <clears throat> but they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Then he said to them the third time, why, what evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they requested who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison but he delivered Jesus to their will. <clears throat> I don't know why it is, but it seems like every time I get into the Bible, there's some current event that seems <laughs> a lot similar, you know. You ever notice that? And, and just not long before I read this, I heard about a committee that had met, and they were deliberating whether or not they should keep God in their mission statement or not. And the moderator said, uh, all in favor say yes, and all in favor say no. And when they did that, he kind of got one of these looks like, what did I hear? So let's do it again. All in favor say yes, all opposing say no. And he got that look again. And so the third time he said, all in favor say yes, and all opposing say no. And then he said, it's in. It's going to put it back in. Now, I'm glad they put it back in. <laughs> However, <laughs> I have read Ru Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, we had an FFA group that operated by those rules, and I had to learn them at school. And nowhere do I see that the moderator has the prerogative of declaring what the vote is without truly hearing the consent of the group. And, and so they put it back in, and I'm glad they did. In this case, three times, they holler at Pilate, give us Barabbas, crucify him. And in the end, Pilate gave Jesus over to the crowd and let Barabbas free. I, I just, it just fascinates me how many times the things that happen in the Bible happen right before us in our time, in our place, in, in, our, in our space. It just amazes me. But here are the people demanding that a criminal, really a criminal who had been tried by their law and declared a criminal, be let go in place of Jesus of Nazareth, who was a kind, loving rabbi who looked at the little people and the important people, and he ministered to all of them 
and he loved them all. And he demonstrated that in word and deed all through his ministry. So it's a powerful, powerful commentary upon people who want their own way instead of God's way. May it never be so among us that we want our way instead of God's way. And, you know, we have to sort that out day by day. You know, every day there are issues that come up that cause us to consider, now, is this what God would want me to do or is this just what I want to do? And these people got their way. Now, of course, they were a part of the plan from the beginning. I mean, before the foundation of the earth, all of this was known by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they are just actors in the, in the progress of carrying out what God had already foreseen years and years and centuries ago. So that's the story of how Jesus was carried, taken to the cross, how the trial went, and how they made their decision. Now it says, now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. <clears throat> now again, this is, this is just a little guy. Who is he? Well, it says he was from Cyrene. Cyrene was then the capital of Libya. Guess what other nation's in the news right now? Libya. But there were believers in, in Cyrene, and they would come to Jerusalem every year at the time of the sacrifice, and they would uh, offer their sacrifices. It was required of a male Jew to attend this temple at least three times a year, and I'm sure most of them did. But some of them, it was a difficult process, a lengthy process, a long journey to go and go home again. But it says this, there was certain Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming in from the country, and they conscripted him to carry the cross of Jesus. Now, now there's a long story connected to this, and because he is a little person, and because Luke likes to lift up small people, uh, I, I just like to share with you a story about this. Some years ago, when I was pastoring Agape Ministry, uh, the Full Gospel Businessmen. Anybody remember the Full Gospel Businessmen's groups? A few of you do. You younger people don't know anything about it. But there was a movement in the earth at one time where businessmen got together and to worship Jesus, to pray for each other. And uh, there was a very active chapter here in Muncie. And I, I attended a lot of the meetings and heard a lot of the speakers. But when they would get a speaker that uh, they felt was worthy of going on to Sunday morning, they always met Saturday night, so if they felt there was somebody worthy of presenting to the community on a Sunday morning, a lot of times they'd call me, Eldon, we got so-and-so coming. Uh, would you want to have him come to your pulpit Sunday morning and speak? Well, I did this a number of times, uh, not knowing who they were or, you know, it was a faith move on my part. And, and there was this one man whose name was Norman, Norm Erickton. He was just a little guy from West Virginia. And he did uh, biblical impersonations or monologues about per certain people. Norm carried in his trunk uh, costumes for about 40 different uh, characters in the Bible. And he would go to the church and he would pray and he said, Lord, which character shall I represent here? He'd put on the garb, put on the stuff, and he would walk back and forth, and he would talk about the person that was already depicted in the Bible, but he would portray him in person, try to depict his character and his nature, and let the Holy Spirit work through him. Well, he did Simon the Cyrenian in front of our church. And uh, there was a young man in our church named Ray Bolts, and uh, a lot of you know who he is, and, and uh, uh, the, the wonderful ministry he had in uh, singing the gospel hymns, writing the songs, and so forth. And after Norman told the story of Simon the Cyrenian, who had two sons, and the two sons were to watch the lamb that they had brought for the sacrifice. Every wealthy Jew would bring at least a lamb for the sacrifice. And they had to bring the lamb to, to the temple. The reason they would bring it to the temple was because uh, if, uh, if they had to buy one at the temple, it would probably cost about twice as much as it really was worth. So they would bring their own lamb when they could. And uh, 
uh, Norm predict, uh, pr projected this man, Simon, as bringing the lamb with him, maybe buying one outside of town, maybe bringing one all the way from, from uh, Cyrene, I don't know. But he, he, he allocated that job to his two sons. Sons, watch the lamb. You know, their names are in Mark. Their names were uh, Alexander and Rufus. I don't know what mother would name their son Rufus, but Alexander and Rufus. <laughs> and, and they were the ones to watch the lamb. And, and then you know the story how dad was conscripted to carry the cross, and he lost track of the boys. He lost track of the lamb. And, and Ray brought that all together in a beautiful song. That's one of the songs that uh, made him a popular a gospel singer and writer in, in America for a number of years. And we still appreciate all of that good work that he did. He had a wonderful talent, wonderful ability to do that, to put a story into song. And I've always loved that. I always love putting a story into song so that we can sing it and talk about it. Well, anyway, as, as the story goes, you know that uh, when uh, Simon was at the cross, Norm brings the story together and he says, the two boys came as, as uh, Simon was standing there looking at Jesus upon the cross. And by then his heart had been changed and his heart had been welded to the message of Jesus Christ. And, and the sons kept running up to him and said, Father, Father, we've lost the lamb. And then there's this picture of the father gathering the sons into his arms and saying to the sons, sons, Watch the Lamb. Now, it just dawned on me as I recounted this story, perhaps Simon was one of the first persons ever to recognize the transference from the law where an animal was slain to the new grace where Jesus was on the cross. It just occurred to me, a small person, Simon of Cyrene. And how Luke brings that into the picture all of the gospel writers do, but Luke brings it into the picture how, how Simon was the one who witnessed the transference from the old way of doing things, sacrificing an animal, to the new way of doing things, putting your confidence and faith in the Lamb of God, even Jesus Christ. Remember when John the Baptist first in, introduced him out in the wilderness? Behold the Lamb of God. Why did he use those terms? Why did he say it that way? because that's exactly what Jesus became. He became the sacrifice so that the animals no longer be, were sacrificed for the sins of man, but one was his sins, our sins were put on him forever and forever. So that's one thing that, that I saw in this picture. And then there's another person that uh, uh, David Jeremiah preaches on Moody about 10 o'clock every morning. Sometimes when I'm in the car, I hear him. He had the most beautiful sermon this past week about Mary Magdalene. She is through all of the story. And I was in tears till I got done hearing him talk about Mary Magdalene and how she was honored all through Jesus' ministry. It, it seems like to whom, for, for the one for whom much is forgiven, uh, much is required. And this woman stayed with Jesus. Remember, she and her and uh, uh, Jesus' mother were standing at the foot of the cross when Jesus was dying, says Mary Magdalene and mother. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. Remember that? Well, as, as they were standing there, Jesus from the cross says to John, John, you take my mother to your home. And David Jeremiah pictured that then as John hustling the mother of Jesus away because she didn't need to watch all of this suffering, didn't need to stand there and absorb all of that. And he hustled her away, took her to his home, like a good disciple would do, but Mary Magdalene remained looking at the feet of Jesus. And when they took his body away, who followed? Mary Magdalene. And when they put him in a tomb, they put him in a tomb, who reported it to the disciple? Mary Magdalene. Who's the one that was first at the tomb to put in the body spices? Mary Magdalene. She had so many firsts through this whole story that it's just uncanny. How God honors little people in the midst of all of this other drama. We look at the big drama and we sometimes forget the small people. But what I want to encourage you with today, I don't care how small you feel. I don't care how small you think you are. God's watching your back. 
God's got your case. He's going to do something in your life that you don't expect. Something unusual, something wonderful. And let's never forget that. Probably the greatest thing that's ever going to happen in, in your life or has happened in your life is yet to come. So keep looking, keep watching, keep looking up. Keep watching the one who made it possible, and his name is Jesus. So that's something I saw in the midst of this. But Jesus turning to them when he was being taken away, they mourned and lamented. Verse 28, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, blessed are the barren wombs which that never bore and the breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will it be done in the dry? <clears throat> now, Jesus paints a pretty dismal picture here. He, he, he's saying that uh, if you think things have been bad, there will be a day when things may be a lot worse. So we've been warned about difficult times. And, and, and a lot of people in America right now are going through difficult times. They could read this and say, well, I believe we're in that process right now. It's dismal, you know. There's no work. We don't have adequate this. We don't have adequate that. And, and we are in dismal times. We are in difficult times. Jesus said they would come. And, and forgive us when we preach the gospel that when you receive Jesus, that everything would be rosy from that day on and you would fly away one day and never have a trouble, never have a care. Jesus warns about troubles to come. And he's saying those days are so difficult that it would be better if women did not have to take care of babies, nurse babies, and care for children at that time. It would be better that they did not have that. So that's a somber warning. And had Jesus gone through this? Yes, he had. Are people going through this today? Yes, they are. It, it just so happens that we have it better than most of the people of the world, thanks to our forefathers. But what are we going to give our children? That's my question. What are we giving our children? You know, I see a baby today, I see a mother carrying a baby, and I almost want to say to that baby, son or daughter, I apologize. I had hoped we could give you a better world than I experienced, but I'm sorry, it's not better. It's not good. And our only hope, our only hope, is that they get hold of the, of the power of Jesus Christ in your life and trust him. Is there a formula, formula that puts you, of course not. If there had been, somebody would have, you know, written a book about it and it would have been copyrighted and everybody would be doing it. But there's no formula. But there is a process that we must all go through and that is that we look to the author and the finisher of our faith. We look to the alpha, who will also be our omega. We look to the one who came on earth as a baby, as a child, and grew up as a man among us and showed us how to walk and live, how he took care of his parents in their older ages, how, how he took care of the little children that came to him and said, suffer the little children to come on to me, for of such is the kingdom of God. See, we, we look to him, the one who has uh, created a path like no other man, no other religion ever has. We're so blessed to have the Bible, amen? We're so blessed to have the Bible because it records all of these things that God has done in history come up to the time of Jesus and even to now. But you see, we need to keep reliving the incidents that Jesus went through so that we better understand the sacrifice and better understand the call of God upon our life. You know, uh, I, I'm 81. I have no great plans for the future. I don't even have a plan for the future. I'm looking forward to tomorrow because he's going to be there, see? But, but I'm excited that, to know that the future is closer than it used to be. And I'm looking to the future where we will meet him face to face. I can't imagine what that's like. People try to capture that in words. I, don't, I can't capture it in words. What it would be like when we meet the one who died for us, the one who died for me. And, and he thought enough of me that even where I was, he loved me and died for me but he also loves me enough not to leave me there, not to leave me where I am, but to lead me into something greater. And the greater is always a better relationship with him. It's not fame, it's not power, it's not riches. It's always a better relationship with him. I think we all want that, don't we? 
Don't we want a better relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? That's why we gather together. We're, we're followers of Him because we all desire that. We all hunger for that. And, and the beauty of gathering together with fellow believers is the fact that here's a pilgrim on the same path that I am. And, and God bless you, everyone, who is a pilgrim on the same path that I am. And the path is to learn more about the one who gave me life, who saved me from my sins, who saved me from the darkness that could have overtaken me and swallowed me up, who could have caused me to end my life early, you know, when there was yet things to be done that I could not see at that time. But here I am. And why am I here? It's because of this man that died on the cross at Calvary. It's because of him. There's no other reason that I'm here except because of him. And I love that. I, I treasure that in my heart. And when I meditate and pray, you know, I, I'm nearly always mindful of the fact that I'm here because Jesus loves me. You know, you remember old Karl Barth? Anybody remember Karl Barth? Great theologian, wrote books and books and books. Seminary, I had to read his stuff and write papers. I hated it. I didn't like him. But when he was old and gray, Somebody said to him, Karl Barth, you've written lots of books, lots of theolo theological treatises and so forth. So what is the most important thing you've learned about God? And this old man sitting there watching him thought for a little bit and he says, the greatest thing I've ever learned, Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. Pretty profound. And I dare you to find a greater truth it, was, it blessed me. I liked him a lot better when I heard that, you know, really. I did. I liked him a lot better. Because I like to keep it simple, too. I like to keep it simple. So that's the story. Jesus warns that if we don't stay close to him, we could encounter rough times. We will maybe encounter rough times. But if we stay close to him, he's showing us a path through it all. There, there were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. Verse 33, and when they had come to the place called Calvary. There they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, the, the, the man who had complete possession of his spirit and mind and soul and could feel in his body yet the pain that they had inflicted upon him unjustly, uncalled for, hanging on the cross, the blood flowing out, and he looks at the crowd and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, now that takes just a little more than most of us have. We, we, there has to be a power coming through us to be able to say those words in, in the ears of people who have wronged us and hurt us. It, it's, it, but it's a powerful thing. He who knew no sin, he didn't even sin in his death, saying, you blankety blank so and so, you're going to get yours. You know, isn't that what we'd say? You're going to be sorry that you fooled around with the man of God. He didn't say that. He just said, simply said there with the blood running out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And, and even today, people who want to put him aside or, or cast him out of the church or cast him out of the country, or cast him out of our creeds, they don't know what they're doing. They yet don't know what they're doing. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered. See, even sneering at his confession. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription was also written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and save us. And we know that power was present. You know, it says he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have wiped out the Roman army. In seconds, had he chosen to use that kind of power, he did not use that kind of power. But the other one, answering, rebuked him, said, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. 
Why did this guy have clearer insight than the chief priests who read all of the prophecies? Why? How did this man have that kind of insight on the cross? Do you think the Spirit of Christ had entered into him? I don't know how it happened. They didn't have an evangelistic service and call for people to come forward or raise their hands. They were on the cross, for goodness sake, suffering. And he was suffering just like Jesus and the rest. And this man says, we, we receive due reward for, for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. What an insight from this little man that they called a criminal. And then, then he just said to Jesus, and, and this is probably one of the first confessions of faith <laughs> in the whole Bible, Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. Remember me. Remember how times the Bible says remember? Paul says, I remember you in my prayers. You know, we remember people in our prayers. But this, his prayer was, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, where do you go when you die? I don't know. But I sure like those words. I've shared those words with lots and lots of people, you know, who are close to passing away or wonder about what's going to happen next. I said, I don't know what happens to you. You know, some people say this and some people say that. I've been in some funeral sermons where, <laughs> heard some funeral sermons where they painted a pretty fancy place where this person was already, not knowing where they were, you know. But I would rather believe the words of Jesus, wouldn't you? So when, criminal, when you die, this day you will be with me in paradise. Now, where is that? I don't know. There's no description in the Bible. Well, there's the Old Testament. There's some descriptions of things about the other world. And, and then in the case of the poor man who died and Abraham was in one place and the beggar was with Abraham and the, and the rich man was in a bad place. And, and the rich man said, could you send Lazarus over here and put a little water on my tongue? It's hot here. And they said, between here and there, there's no passage. There's no way. There's a gulf fixed which cannot be transgressed. But wherever Jesus is, that's where I want to be. Isn't that where you want to be? So you can take these words seriously. I do. I take them seriously. See, I just know everybody has a day of appointment. You know, I, I don't plan for it, but he's got a plan for it. And whenever that is, that's fine. You know, I'm not going to live till I'm be a hundred. Some people, I'm going to live till I be such and such. I think that's kind of a foolish boast. You don't know how long you're going to live. You know, some of us may not get home today. I'm not predicting anything, but we, you know, we don't know when it will. I'm just to say we don't know when it will be. You know, we don't know when or how it will be. My wife always prays that we go together. Now think about that for a minute. Somebody said, well, that means you may have an accident and you both go. She said, so? <laughs> Just trust it isn't too painful, you know? But she thinks, she thinks we're one, and if one of us go, we only have half a person. So why would God want half a person you know, when he wants a whole person, you know? So I think these words are a comfort, and I would suggest sharing with people who don't know what's going to happen because we can't tell them for sure. Unfortunately, people have gone, seldom come back. And, and the ones that do have different kinds of stories about what they saw and what they heard. And, but there's no theological base for where that is or where it, will ha when, where it will happen. But Jesus just said to the guy on the cross who had just gotten saved, I think, <laughs> just gotten saved, I'm going to die. Will you remember me in your kingdom? I say to you, assuredly, this day you will be with me in paradise. Can there be anything more powerful than that? I can't think of anything. So that might be a help to you sometime. Now it's about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour, then verse 45. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And the, and the Bible says it was torn from the top to the bottom, which means that there was nothing human in that process. God was basically saying through the torn veil, now you have access directly to me. You don't know it, need to go through the sacrifice. You don't need to go through the priest. You have 
direct access to me in the Holy of Holies. You know how that was such a sacred thing that they would go into that Holy of Holies once a year, put blood on the, on the uh, altar in there and, and beg, beg, basically pray and beg for the forgiveness of Israel for all of their sins for the year. And uh, when the priest went in, he went in with a rope around his ankle just in case he hadn't fully prepared because he prepared for a month before he went in there, purifying himself, doing this, doing that, praying. Maybe he had other priests pray over him. I don't know what all they did to prepare. But they went in with fear and trembling with a uh, rope around their ankle and little bells on their, on their garment. And if the bell stopped ringing too long, I guess there was people ready to grab the rope, pull him out. It was an awesome thing. Once a year, they could go into that place where God was. And they would wait for a sign from God, you know. Did you hear a word from God? Did we see a sign from God? What's God saying to us? And only once a year did they have that privilege of going into the Holy of Holies. God's saying now, all of y'all can come anytime. Come on over. The party's on. The temple is rent. And I did it. The temple is rent, and I did it. So, this is, this is such a beautiful story. And then the temple was dark, the sun was dark, and the veil of the temple was torn. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Now, how much power do we have over our spirit? You, you know that when, we know that when we die, our spirit leaves the body. And the former verse suggests to me that it goes somewhere where Jesus is, wherever that is. You can, you know, draw your own picture, use your own imagination. But he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. To me, to me this is a powerful way to depart this life. I'll tell you why. You know, when you're dying and you're in pain, you don't know what's happening. You don't know what's going to be next. You don't know what's going to happen to you once life goes out of your body. Once the breath goes out of your body, you're done. And here Jesus gives an example that when, they were, when he was near the time, he didn't allow the devil to come in and hassle him. He didn't allow him to come with questions and doubts and fears. He just said, Father, I know it's my time. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I've shared that with quite a few older people who don't know what's going to happen. But I think both of those phrases are words of comfort for us as we pass from this life to the next. Number one, I don't know where I'll go, but I'll be with Jesus. He said so. I'm not telling you that. He said so. And also, I have some power over the process. So I don't have to lay there and think about I hope I can get well so I can get saved, or I wonder what's going to happen to my family. I, I wonder all of these things. But when the time comes, and you know the time is there, say, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. You know, I've, I've developed a little bit of a, uh, for me it's kind of a comical way that when a doctor slaps a baby in the back, whew, you got a breath. When you die, whew, where does the breath go? I have a kind of, in my own imagination, think that God maybe has a rent-a-breath place. <laughs> Whoosh. Whoosh. Where does it go? I don't know. The wind blows where it will. You get crazy when you're older. You know. <laughs> I give you that privilege. So, when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this man was a righteous man. This man was a righteous man. A soldier said that. A Roman soldier declared the righteousness of Jesus when the Pharisees couldn't even see that he was the Messiah. Isn't that awesome? God uses little people like you and me to do great things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. 
Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision indeed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for his body. Then he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever laid before. That what was, that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after and they observed the tomb and how his body had, had been laid or where his body was laid. Joseph of Arimathea, uh, one of the, on, on the council, one of the scribes, among the scribes and the Pharisees, heard all of their discussion, said he did not consent. Well, I don't, you can't prove this, I guess, from the Bible, but also there was a man named Nicodemus in, in the Gospel of John who questioned Jesus about who he was and how he did the things that he did. And it seems that Nicodemus became a believer. And, and uh, uh, tradition has it, it that it was Nicodemus and, and um, Joseph who took his body down, wrapped it in a sheet, and put it in a grave. That's the story. But Mary Magdalene followed to see what they did, and she reported it to the rest. You know, I, how unlikely that somebody from the Sanhedrin would do this. How unlikely. But even there, even though those two men may have been a minority, sometimes God uses the minority. He doesn't always, you know, God doesn't go by your vote and my vote like the majority always wins. God picks people, significant people at significant times to do something for his glory and to honor him. And I believe those two men did honor Jesus in his death by taking care of his body. They didn't have the power before, but now they had the power and authority to do something that the council had ordered that he, be, you know, when they were put on a cross sometimes they were left there for days and hours. They say some of the Roman roads were lined with uh, bodies of people on crosses in all stages of decay. Some were skeletons. That's how cruel the Romans were. And probably when they put somebody on the cross, very seldom were they taken down be be before, you know, that soon, that quickly. But these two men used what authority they had, what impressions they had of him to gather up his body and put it in a grave, in a tomb, to honor him and, and to give glory to God in their own way, that we honor the one that you have sent by honoring his body in his death. Well, you say it's not, you know, it's not a rabid conversion, but it's, it's a simple, it's a symbol of what God can do through people who have a mind to hear what he's saying and to observe what he's doing and try to be a part of it instead of a hindrance. And, and may that be true of us, that when we hear the stories of this day and the stories of those who try to lead us, uh, may we be able to discern truth. You will know the truth. The truth will make you free. It doesn't always make you comfortable. It may never make you rich, but it'll make you free. And would you rather be free or in bondage? I would rather be free. I would rather be free and dead than alive and wealthy, wouldn't you? So you, we have a choice here, and you are all uh, a compilation of the choices that you have made so far. So I pray that the choices that you make from this day on, after we recount this, we usually do this at Easter, so it's kind of awkward coming on this in this time of year, the fall, you know. It's kind of hard to get into the spirit of it because then I began to see things that he wanted me to know. So. I, I relish the fact that he allowed me to see those things that I pointed out to you. They're important to me, and I think they're important to him because they're recorded here. But I pray that from this day forth that you will seek the truth. Seek the truth, and the truth will make you free. Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word and for what you have done through it. Uh, really, when we talk about it, we don't add anything to it. The word itself is the truth. And uh, even though we have some idea of what we think about it, we, we, we're, we're really at a loss to know how to relate it. So thank you, Lord, for this word, and bless each one who has come today. Uh, may they find your peace and, and your challenge in all of their life, and may their next steps be full 
of your promise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us?
I'd like to ask you for a favor today as we leave. We're the body of Christ. We represent Him everywhere we are, including here. And look around, and if you see somebody that you've never seen here before, just take the time to shake their hand, introduce yourself. It's amazing to me how much that does for someone who's visiting and how much uh, it does for you because now you've made a, a new friend, a new contact, and uh, that's so important. We, we don't allow too many opportunities for that. This is a great opportunity. You look around, there's somebody that you've not met. Maybe there's been somebody coming here all the time you've come, and you've come for eight or ten years, and you still don't know their name. It's time. It's really time. So as soon as we close with prayer, just look around, see a strange face or a face you want to know, well then just go shake their hand, introduce yourself. It's not hard. Hello, my name's Eldon Morehouse. What's yours? That's all it is. And it works. It's, it's a great thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a grace toward them. It's a feeling of love toward them. See? Okay. You all know that, but I'm just reminding you it's time to begin to do that. Well, Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the power of your word. May it sink deep in our hearts. May it uh, root out everything that's negative to your truth, and may your truth overtake us and fill us and impel us, O oh God, to do the things you want us to do. Thank you for this day, in Jesus' name. And all the people said amen. 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 <laughs> Gonna have to get a chair lift up.